Hey listeners, my name is Shara Donahue, and this is The Bible Never Said That. On this podcast, we talk about popular sayings that make their way through culture and churches, even though they theologically can steer people in the wrong direction. This week, we are examining the phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness. This phrase is so popular that even dictionary.com gives us a definition about where it came from and what it means, and their site informs us that being clean is a sign of spiritual purity or goodness, as in, don't forget to wash your ears, cleanliness is next to godliness. This phrase was first recorded in a sermon by John Wesley in 1778, but the idea is ancient, found in Babylonian and Hebrew religious tracts. It is still invoked often as an admonition to wash or clean up. Yep. We still use this phrase to get people to physically clean up, but it's not in the Bible. It's mostly used to manipulate others to clean their bodies or their homes to our standards by invoking the name of God and placing it alongside our desire. Now, that is dangerous people. This is not territory you want to be walking on. We need to be very careful not to confuse our desires with God's. Some defend the saying by pointing to the exhortation of Paul mentioned in 1 Corinthians 14.40, which says, But all things should be done decently and in order. For all you who love neatness. Nice try. But this verse in context is talking about the order a worship service should take. Jesus is the one who makes it clear that physical cleanliness is not next to godliness. We don't want to be like the Pharisees in Matthew 15, who came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus rebuked them for being hypocrites and breaking the commands of God in order to preserve their tradition. And then he says to the crowd in verse 10, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Then, in Luke 15, we have this story starting at verse 37. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people! Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? So, listening to Jesus, our outward cleanliness is not of great concern, but we should still ask, What kind of cleanliness does God care about? Beyond being a steward of the gifts God gives us, the Bible does have a lot to say about what makes a person or a culture clean or unclean. We find this concept most clearly in Leviticus. Now, I have said it for years, and I will say it again. Leviticus is the grossest book in the Bible. (laughs) It talks about oils and bodily emissions freely, and it's just kind of ick. But God knew they would need to know these things in order how to care for disease in a fallen world. So he equipped his people. There are dietary restrictions, fabric considerations, and many laws that address the distinctions between what is clean and unclean and how to become clean again. If you experience disease or touch something you shouldn't, it's usually only time that is prescribed, and then you are clean again. Sometimes a priest must aid in the process, but when it comes to spiritual defilement by sin, sacrifice is needed. Sin requires atonement, a reconciliation to God through some kind of reparation. 
Before Jesus' ultimate sacrifice, this meant animal sacrifice, and Leviticus details the specifics of what that looked like. A priest would have to be personally atoned for, and then he could offer atonement for the people. But there is a section in Leviticus 13 that strikes a deep chord of need that we all have in our own lives, and it starts at verse 45. Anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkept, cover the lower part of their face, and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. The alienation of those marked as unclean is painful, but the ache of unclean heart is more vexing indeed. Leprosy itself was a pernicious disease that was much more common in the ancient Near East. It was devastating, though, no matter where it was found. But in 2 Kings 5, we have a story where an unclean heart within infects the outside body with its ails. The story begins with Leprous Naaman, commander of the Syrian army, traveling and seeking out healing from the prophet of God, Elisha, in Israel. It took a bit for Naaman to humble himself, but once he did and he obeyed Elisha's instructions, he was made clean and recognized the power of the Lord. This is a story we often see in children's Bibles. However, we don't usually hear about Elisha's assistant, Gehazi, and how he tried to greedily hustle some benefits from God's work. Elisha, the prophet, had turned down tribute from Naaman for the work he knew God had done, but Elisha's servant followed, and at verse 20 we see, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, See, my master has spared this Naaman, the Syrian, in not accepting from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi followed Naaman, and when Naaman saw someone running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me to say... There have just now come to me from the hill country of Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. And Naaman said, Be pleased to accept two talents. And he urged him and tied up two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothing and laid them on two of his servants. And they carried them before Gehazi. And when he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and put them in the house. And he sent the men away, and they departed. He went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant went nowhere. <laughs> he said to him, Did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male servants and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence a leper like snow. Gehazi wore the defilement of his heart upon his skin for the rest of his life. But it is clear that God commutes the condition for Naaman, whose heart was humbled and body cleansed in repentance. This humility is something we should seek out when looking for healing. We see it again in Jesus' healing of the leper in Luke 5, starting at verse 12. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I am struck by the humility in the midst of sorrow here. 
it is this great acknowledgement of the holiness of Jesus and a recognition of his power that this desperate man says, if you are willing, and Jesus's compassion meets the forlorn soul. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourselves to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Our cleansing can be a testimony to others. The cleansing and healings that we experience are a personal blessing, but they also offer hope to those who also need cleansing themselves. While leprosy sounds like torment and being exiled from the rest of your people lonely, it is nothing compared to what awaits the soul that has not been cleansed by Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6 7 through 11 reminds us that a sin stained soul keeps us from the kingdom of God. It declares, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Such were some of you. Such was I. But when we ask Jesus if he will cleanse us, If he is willing to be our atonement, we can be assured he answered that question with yes on the cross. 1 John 1 tells us we can stop trying to hide our sin alone in the darkness and step into the light. Beginning at verse 7, John writes to a group of people, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He can cleanse all those who come to him from all unrighteousness because he is both our high priest and atonement. To conclude this voyage through the messiness of life, let's look at Hebrews 9 verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience? from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. All the talk of clean and unclean in Leviticus is wrapped up here in Hebrews with great hope Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant that secures our eternal redemption, not because cleanliness is next to godliness, but because God has already provided the cleanliness we all need through Christ. My prayer for us all today will be paraphrased from the first 12 verses of Psalm 51. Would you pray with me? Have mercy on us, God. 
according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. For we know our transgressions and our sin is ever before us against you. You only have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. We were brought forth in iniquity and in sin we were conceived. Help us to delight in truth in the inward being and learn as you teach us wisdom in the secret heart. Purge us with hyssop and we shall be clean. Wash us and we shall be whiter than snow. Let us hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from our sins and blot out all our iniquities. Create in each of us a clean heart, O God, and renew right spirits within us. Cast us not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and uphold us with the willing spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. You can find this episode's show notes at lifeaudio.com or on iTunes. And we are so thankful for the reviews you've left. And if you haven't left one yet, we love hearing from you so that more people can find us. Until next time, may you seek the abundant life Jesus died to give and live in the truth that sets people free.